Hello and welcome to episode 403 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this fine June 4th? Very significant day. Bill, how are you? It is a significant day, Seth, and, and I feel like we're going to enter a wormhole and go back in time from 1945 to 1942. How's that mm -hmm. happening, Seth? In, indeed. Well, it's happening because of the guest on our show, as you can plainly see if you're watching. Uh, we're happy to welcome him back to the show. He's been with us once before to talk about one of his earlier books, and it's been so long, I'm going to reintroduce him. Uh, this gentleman is the writer or collaborator on over 20 nonfiction books. He's a New York Times bestseller. He was awarded the DOD's Thomas Jefferson Award for Best Article in 2010. More pertinent to this show, however, he is the author of the fantastic book, Race of Aces, World War II's Elite Airmen and the Epic Battle to Become the Master of the Sky, which is about the air war over New Guinea. But even more important to this show today, he is the author of the new book, 53 Days on Starvation Island, the World War II Battle that Saved Marine Corps Aviation. Welcome back to the show, John Bruning. How are you? Hey, thanks, Seth. I'm great. I'm just so happy to be back here. You guys are awesome. Love talking to you about Race of Aces. Uh, what was that, two years ago, maybe? It's been a while. Almost. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been, been a, while. a while. And could yeah. you have picked a more gripping title, John, than 53 Days on Starvation Island? I don't think there's, I don't think I've read a better title for a history book oh. that just draws you in. You want to read it when you see the cover. Wow, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I've kind of been wondering if we should have put Guadalcanal somewhere on there and John L. Smith and Mary Carl's names and, and Dick Mangrum. Um, but uh, it seems to have resonated with people. So, Bill, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and, and just for, for, for reference, here it is. Uh, if, if anybody wants to go pick up a copy, do so. It is a fascinating book on a very interesting topic, one that we've talked about before, but we're more than happy to get into again, which, of course, is the early days of the Cactus Air Force on Guadalcanal. Hence the reason Bill said we've gone down the wormhole in the 1942. But <laughs> if anybody knows me, then they, they know that I'm always willing to discuss Guadalcanal. Um, well, this may be a 40 second episode on Guadalcanal, Seth. I don't know. I, I stopped counting. <laughs> we, did, we did do quite a few. <laughs> We it is an important there. moment in American history, for sure, and especially yeah. the Pacific War. And there's so many different aspects to it. No. It, it, um, it it's incredible, and it and it's still. And I say it to my dying day: it it was the turning point campaign of the Pacific War, and, and, and you know, it's the meat grinder, as John Parshall always said. We needed a meat grinder. Guadalcanal was that meat grinder. Well, let's yeah. talk about the Cactus Air Force, guys. So, I mean, everybody knows that Guadalcanal was invaded on the 7th of August, 1942, almost said 2022, which, yeah, anyway, point being, uh, which I guess kind of may have been. But regardless of this, um, United States lands on Guadalcanal August 7th, 1942. And the reason, one of the many reasons that we take Guadalcanal or we try to take Guadalcanal is to establish an, an air presence there to stop that interdiction, which you just said, John, to the sea lanes of Australia and the New Hebrides and Fiji and Samoa and all this other stuff that's down there. Point being, Henderson Field becomes the focal point of literally every single thing that happens on the island of Guadalcanal from the 7th of August until the end of the campaign. Either we're trying to defend it or initially capture it, then defend it, and the Japanese are trying to recapture it or knock it out. And the reason for that is because it was the unsinkable aircraft carrier. That's that's what the Japanese called it. That's not what we called it. It was the unsinkable aircraft carrier. And it harbored some of the greatest American heroes of that early portion of the war. And, and I'm talking about the aviators. And, of course, this is, of course, the Cactus Air Force. Now, the Cactus Air Force had a rather inauspicious beginning. Uh, you know, Admiral Gormley wanted to throw airplanes on, on Henderson Field or what would soon become Henderson Field almost immediately. We were not ready. The field wasn't ready. But some of the guys that start coming in here, they get there in August. I mean, they, they, they're not there immediately, but it's not far after when some of these guys start landing in here. These are some of these SBDs. These are some of these uh, MAG-23. These are some F4F Wildcats, VMF-223. And we're going to get into these personalities here 
But what can you tell us about these two squadrons specifically, the SBD squadron and then VMF uh, and then the fighters uh, under John L. Smith? What can you tell us about these two squadrons, John? Uh, the whole thing, as as John L. and Dick Magram discussed uh, the situation in Fiji when they were fully briefed, they realized the entire air plan for the invasion of Guadalcanal was an afterthought. And they were the afterthought, literally. And I, I really, it, it starts on July 1st, 1942, when you have uh, Dick Mangrum and his squadron, VMS B-232, and John L. Smith's squadron, VMF-223, at about um, a fifth to a sixth of what their TOE should be. They don't have airplanes. They don't have pilots. They don't have ground crew. They had to beg, borrow, and steal a clerk just to have somebody who could type up their dailies. Um, it was a, it was a desperate situation where they, they basically, uh, they were a nub of a squadron, both of them. And, and 232 had been a pre-war squadron. Uh, and after Pearl Harbor, they kept slicing off the experienced guys in the unit to um, flush out the new ones being formed. So they were basically using them as um, uh, uh, tearing them apart. 232 anyway, to be cadres uh, for other newly formed units. So these guys on July 1st, 1942, were squadron commanders in name only. <clears throat> but that changed when they got summoned to MAG-23 headquarters. And they showed up, they sat down, and they were told, you're going to be fleshed out to full strength, as much as full strength as we can manage. You have one month to train your new guys uh, you're going to get some of the Midway veterans Almost. who have just arrived. <laughs> and then you're going to need to be prepared for combat in the South Pacific. And they're like, okay, we've got our marching orders. And within days, they started getting uh, uh, second lieutenants fresh from training command in the States. So these guys uh, literally went from Pensacola and Corpus Christi to San Diego. And the way the pipeline worked, they were supposed to get their combat tactics and their carrier uh, air group qualification training at San Diego and what was called the um, advanced carrier training group. Mm -hmm. um, they barely got a couple of hours before they were put aboard ships and taken to Hawaii and parceled out to the two squadrons. And as a result, when they started looking at who was coming into the unit, they realized that even the Midway guys they were getting hardly had any experience. I mean, the Midway guys were lauded as the combat veterans, the guys who had the only institutional combat experience in the Marine Corps at the time. And that consisted for most of them of 60 minutes in combat over Midway, where most of VMF 221 was wiped out. And then the dive bomber guys from 241, uh, their, their some total combat experience was three, three missions. One didn't see any contact with the enemy and they lost Three skippers, every time they went out, they lost their commanding officer and they lost most of the squadron uh, through the course of the, the three missions. So they arrived with, you know, enough combat experience to believe that they were doomed. And that played a significant role in how these two squadrons formed and gelled because the new guys were so grass green, they didn't know what to fear and they didn't know what... Um, what to be afraid of. Uh, but the Midway guys were with the exception of, of Mary and Carl, uh, they were, they were literally traumatized and they were very fatalistic. They didn't think they were going to survive this. So in some ways, you know, you don't want to call anybody a locker room cancer, but they were definitely black clouds in both squadrons. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if you look at what they, I, I want to take a step back to what you said, you know, in July, you know, these guys have nothing. And they're told, oh, by the way, you're going to be a part of this operation. That is a microcosm of the entire Guadalcanal campaign. <laughs> it, it really 100%. is. It really yep. is. You know, Operation Shoestring. That's why that's oh. why guys called it that, you know, shoestring budget, you know. A hundred percent. And you know, <laughs> like like even the departure was a complete and total yard sale. Uh, they were told they were going to be leaving in early August 
by the way, they didn't get the full month of training. These, these guys just, just as an aside, these guys came in with virtually no experience in F4F Wildcats or SBD Dauntlesses. The most advanced thing that they had flown was maybe a check ride in a Buffalo, uh, in San Diego. Uh, maybe they got an hour in an SBD at Coronado before they, they left. I mean, it was, it was literally straight from training to, Hey, by the way, you're in a combat squadron now, and you're going to be in combat in a month. Um, when they were stood up and given their, uh, their move order, they were supposed to go out on a Tuesday, the first Tuesday in August. And they were going out on, uh, the CVE long Island, the very first Mm -hmm. escort carrier we built that, got moved up by 48 hours after they gave everybody leave. So the squadron had uh, the squadron leadership in, in both cases had to basically troll the bars and hotels around uh, Honolulu, finding everybody uh, and getting them aboard the ship. And it was just a complete and total chaotic, uh, you know, get to the ship immediately, get on board cram everything you can into the uh, cockpits of your SBDs because that's all you're going to have, you know, to begin with. And the thing that was, you know, pretty remarkable about that is they managed to find everybody, but one guy, one Mm -hmm. enlisted guy ended up being left on the beach and he went out with VMF 224. But yeah. Hotel street isn't that big, John. It's (laughs) (laughs) There were all the bars and hangouts. It's one street. So, yeah. Oh, is it really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So they, they, they got everybody on board ship and then they had, nobody had any idea where they were going. It wasn't until they got diverted to Fiji that, that uh, somebody from Gormley staff came and briefed them. And mm-hmm. when they heard the briefing, they realized that this was um, a complete mess complete mess and that they were being thrown into something that they likely would not survive. Uh, so there's a moment in the book I wrote where Scotty McLennan, who was one of the Ivy leaguers in John L. Smith's squadron, he sits down, you know, realistically assesses his chances of survival, given his level of experience and what they were facing. And he writes a letter to his brother and asks him to take care of his uh, wife he just married. He said, look, I don't think I'm going to survive this. I need you to take care of her for me so I know she's okay. And he mails that at Afate just before they go out and uh, do the cat launch off of the Long Island, which, you know, the the cat launch in itself is a story that um, isn't really well understood or or told. very often in the secondary sources, but it was a big deal to these Marines, uh, mm-hmm. most of whom had only done their, you know, uh, requisite basic carrier qual landings and takeoffs off the Hornet uh, after they got to uh, Hawaii in July. Uh, but the cat shot off the Long mm-hmm. Island was exceptionally dangerous. You know, it, another thing you said uh, that I want to touch on too, because this is something I don't think people understand. Uh, is that, you know, you said these guys, the Midway guys, of which there were a handful, uh, were very fatalistic. And I don't think people understand that, is that this is still seven months after Pearl Harbor. So, I mean, the, 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 the great United States military that you see in the Pacific in 1944, that was still, exactly. yeah, that didn't even, that wasn't even remotely close to existing. <laughs> The people that we could field, as you said, I mean, it's a perfect example, are green green as grass or very few combat veterans. And what you just said, the, the Navy, certain, the Navy pilots certainly had more combat experience than the Marine Corps did. But the only Marine Corps aviators that did were those guys, well, that, that were not in Japanese hands, of course, I'm talking about Wake Island people, were those who survived the Battle of Midway, of which there were very few, Mary and Carl being one, Bill Brooks being another. I knew Bill Brooks, who was a Brewster pilot, who was lucky enough to survive that. But, um, you know, we're throwing, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to degrade anybody and say it was the bottom of the barrel because it certainly was not, but we're throwing what we had, which at that time was not a whole hell of a lot. And that went from everything, not just pilots and aircraft, but to ships, you know, supplies, everything. This was a, it was touch and go from the start. 
from the very, very start. And, and, and these guys certainly endured, you know, the fuzzy end of the lollipop, if you will. What did they know, so, John, before they took off? I mean, the, the name Starvation Island, of course, is what the Japanese ended up calling it. Um, what did the Marines know when they took off about where they were going and what they were going to face when they got there? They didn't have aeronautical maps. They didn't have much knowledge of the area at all. The sum total of their understanding of the Solomons came out of an uh, issue of National Geographic that was in the wardroom of the Long Island. Um, and there's a moment on the Long Island the day they launched, which was August 20th, uh, that had a catastrophic effect on morale. Uh, the MAG-23 senior officer was um, a combat veteran from Nicaragua uh, who had received the Distinguished Flying Cross for actions in N Nicaragua. And his name was Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Fike. I want to say he was the XO or the ops officer. I think he was the ops officer without going back and looking at the book. I think he was the ops officer for uh, MAG-23. <clears throat> and... Uh, he gathered everybody together and thinking that he was giving them a pep talk. He told them <laughs> your job is to go up to Guadalcanal and buy time with your lives so that we can get more men and planes onto the Island. And everybody looked around and were, were like, wait a minute, this is a suicide mission. They didn't say anything like that in Fiji. And I, I mean, right there within two or three hours of the launch fike just completely tanked morale and that's something that that uh over and over and over again i saw in the source material where the guys were talking about that day was how much they ended up hating charlie fike first for that for that pep talk and second um how Fike handled the the launch himself. He didn't show up for any of the catapult instruction briefings. He just figured he would be the last one off the deck and he'd just uh, take off in an F4F, you know, standard, you know, normal takeoff. Um, the skipper of the Long Island was the senior officer present and he pulled Fike aside and said, you're going to do what a leader does and that is you're going to go first so That's you're going to take guy you're going to bring you're yeah. going to go first <laughs> yeah fike was not happy about that so what happened was uh he took one of the 19 wildcats so he wasn't the actual first to launch dick mangram was uh because the sbds uh, were the ones that were cat shot right. off the right. ship first but fike was the first of the fighter pilots and, and, you know, he was hated so much that years later, one of, one of the pilots who watched him nearly crash because he didn't attend the briefings um, said, unfortunately, the F4F was a stable platform and didn't enter into a spin and he survived. I mean, that's how cold and, and uh, animosity filled the guys were over, over Fike. Now, to be sure... Fike does some things on Guadalcanal that are really exemplary. I mean, they didn't have a, a, a search and rescue operation at all. And several times Fike went out and rescued down pilots in a little unarmed uh, Grumman duck uh, seaplane. And he, he would go out and search for guys. Ensign Fink from Flight 300 and his gunner, um, they were rescued by, by Fike. So... I, I don't want to say the guy was a complete loss uh, by any means, but, um, you know, Mary and Carl, when I interviewed him in 91 said to me, I didn't think of him. Uh, I didn't think much of him as a, as an officer. And I didn't think he was a very good Marine. So um, there was, there was definitely tension uh, with the brass from the, from the get go. You know, you, you what, talked about the, the mag 23s morale tanking in there and and it's only going to get worse as their time on guanacanal lives or, or goes through however when these guys arrive on the island on august 20th the morale for the guys ashore skyrockets uh general archer vandergrift 
is one of the first Marines there when these SBDs land. And there's footage of this stuff. There's footage of these SBDs coming ashore on, on, on Guadalcanal. Uh, he grabs the hand of the first pilot that he sees that's climbing. And, and you might know who that was. I don't. Uh, climbs out of his cockpit and he's shaking. And he's like just pumping his hand. And he, he, Vandergrift's got tears in his eyes. And he says, thank God you've come. Thank God you've come because the Marines and we all know the story. They were not abandoned, but they felt like they had been abandoned on that island. And the the first thing that they that made them feel like they actually had some support or when those airplanes landed on Henderson Field. So, I mean, that was a huge, huge thing. John, we know the story of, you know, of Guadalcanal being, you know, a hellhole for anybody who lived on that island. These are pilots who, you know, by and large, for the most part, lived a pretty good life on the States in the States. You know, they had good quarters. They had good, relatively good chow. Yeah, they, it was, it wasn't bad. You get to Guadalcanal and this is a complete flip flop of what you ever had before. I mean, the living conditions, and we're going to get to the personalities in a minute, but the living conditions I think needs to be stressed here because not just for the pilots, but for the ground crew that comes later that have to maintain these aircraft, it made something that was already difficult infinitely more difficult just being on that damn island talk about that a little bit if you can well if you look at any other deployment in combat of any service uh united states service there's literally nothing like guadalcanal for aviators nothing they were so when they arrived when they landed on august 20th they didn't have any of their logistical infrastructure. Their ground crew wasn't there. They didn't have their gear. They didn't even have mess tins. They didn't have uh, cups or silverware. They didn't have sleeping gear. Uh, they didn't have any way to sustain themselves. The The ground crew, they, they ended up for several days living under the wings of the aircraft. The pilots were able to uh, get some captured Japanese mats uh from from the mud marines like straw mats and uh they procured some some tarps and uh set them up in between trees and that's how they lived for the first about week they were there and on top of that you know just the the austere conditions you've got the the um pestilence issue you know the the diseases that come along with living in in the jungle in such conditions so everybody got sick very quickly uh it ranged from gastrointestinitis in, in, in yeah something like that um basically a term from the 40s um dysentery uh, uh malaria uh parasites you know amoebic dysentery i mean they they got sick very quickly uh the Japanese called the island Starvation Island, but what we forget as Americans is that the Marines were slowly starving too because when the Navy pulled out and Richmond Ke Kelly Turner uh, got the uh, uh, withdrew the transports, they had, what, three units of fire worth of ammunition, so three days' worth of ammunition, and they had um, virtually no food. So they were surviving off of food they captured from the Japanese on the first day when they took the airfield on August 7th. And that food was, was um, in very poor shape. So uh, like, you know, maggoty, weevily nice. rice, it was terrible. So the food was bad. The water was bad. Uh, there was uh, major issues with uh, just basic um, aircraft operation. For example, with VMSB 232, they flew in with 500 pound bombs, which made the cat shot off the Long Island even more complicated because they had to carry ordnance off uh, the deck in low wind conditions. And they had to do it because there weren't hardly any bombs right. on the island of Guadalcanal. They had what they went in with. In fact, they didn't get the ship killer 1,000 pounders until a uh, wayward squadron from, I think, the Saratoga landed and they were convinced as they were being um, uh, refueled and sent back to, to their carrier, uh, they were convinced to leave their thousand pound bombs behind. And that stock of thousand pounders were what uh, 
uh, what the guys used when they went after the two uh, transport forces in, uh, the, you know, during the Eastern Solomons and, uh, and then again on August 28th. So even, even just basic ordinance was an issue and getting the bombs loaded onto SPDs in muddy, rainy conditions without bomb trucks. I mean, can you imagine manhandling a 500 pounder takes four men and that's you know it's doable yeah Yeah. it's it's doable but you got to remember these guys are starving they're not in top physical condition as as young men you know they're they're starving they're sick they've got diarrhea uh they're dehydrated the conditions are are hot and humid and at night it get cold uh so they were they were in really, really bad shape within just a couple of days. And they're being tasked with, you know, like loading a 500 pound bomb by hand under an SPD. Now, I mean, that's bad enough, but imagine doing that with a thousand pounder and slogging through the mud with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And these are the sorts of challenges that they, they had just operating, but, then you layer into the fact that the first night they arrived was uh, the uh, the the Battle of the Tenderloin Alligator River. Creek. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Allig- Alligator Creek, and uh, you know they wake up and they're not even sure if there's going to be an airfield or if they're going to be overrun. I mean, the guys were sleeping with their forty fives out, you know, uh, as they're on those Japanese straw mats. Taking off was a challenge because not just of the conditions of the runway, um, the runway was gravel and it was when, when they would take off, the gravel would just pummel the underside of the aircraft. And for the SBDs, it destroyed their dive flaps. It just completely um, tore apart the, uh, the perforated uh, uh, mm-hmm. flaps they used. So that became an operational problem. It dented and chipped the propellers. The ground crew, when they did arrive, had to file down the props to keep them uh, um, usable because they didn't have any replacements. Uh, And then they're taking fire from machine guns just at the end of the runway as they're taking off and landing. So they're being shot at as they're operating their aircraft. But also there were snipers and infiltrators through the 53 days where they were getting sniped, they were getting machine gunned. There's a moment after uh, Edson's Ridge, there was a Japanese machine gun somewhere close to the encampment. Uh, and those guys, that crew opened up on uh, some of the 223 guys uh, who were just taking a bath in a, in a, in a river. And one of them, um, Ramlo, gets shot as a result and wounded. So um, you had that factor as well. I mean, and, and we're not even talking combat with, with Japanese air power from Rabaul yet. We're talking right. just about the, you know, the basics of, of what it looked like to be on the Island in, in, in late August. So it's you had all, all yeah. of those things going on. And then you layer in the naval bombardments, the air attacks, the yeah. nightly raids by uh, Washing Machine Charlie and Louis the Louse, uh, where they were denied sleep. So they were sleep deprived. They were losing weight. They were eating terrible food. They didn't even have their own mess uh, until um, VMS B-232's legendary cook finally arrived towards the end of August. Um, they were eating with the mud marines of the 11th uh, Marines, the artillery unit. And, uh, and slowly they were, they were able to start getting some of their gear in, but then, uh, most of their stuff was aboard the William Ward Burroughs, right? And the Burroughs' skipper was not the first team. And this guy gets into Guadal- uh, the waters around Guadalcanal, um, I want to say the first week, uh, first few days of September and promptly runs his, uh, ship aground twice. And to get off of the reefs that he ran aground on, uh, they dumped most of Mag 23's gear into the water. And by the way, this is Sylvie. <laughs> she has more friends on social media <laughs> than me. You are, so John Parshall calls his cats the kitty butai. But um... uh, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, uh, I did a you podcast. Come up with a clever name, John. 
uh i did a podcast years ago uh with my daughter where we were talking about historians and their cats and what they name them and we went into great detail on john parshall's uh fur family for sure yes <laughs> yes i have uh i used to have a cat and he, he just recently passed named errol flynn oh and, right and uh I have a German shepherd who's made multiple appearances on this show named Gunther, and he's named after a guy that I knew quite well, Gunther Rall. So, oh, Gunther Rall, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, bad dude right there. But you know, so talking John, about go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Real quick, folks may wonder what the heck we needed dive bombers on Guadalcanal for. Just fifteen seconds on that. So they say the fighter pilots make the headlines and the dive bomber pilots make the history and it's so right. true you look at you look at what happened at midway it was the dive bomber pilots yep. and uh mangrum and vmsb 232 were there to stop the japanese uh reinforcement attempts on the island by sinking the ships that were coming in to bring uh men and supplies to the island so they could launch a counteroffensive and push the marines out so Good. Let's talk about these guys. They they land on the twentieth, like you said. Their first the, the next day, the, the the first day that they're actually wake up on the island, they are sent aloft to interdict incoming Japanese aircraft. This is going to be the first combat experience of a lot of these guys. I believe it's um, yeah, it's M Major John L. Smith. We'll talk about him extensively here in just a second. Uh, he lifts off a cactus with three other Wildcats to go take on a flight of six zeros. So they're not even there 24 hours and they're thrown into the fire, literally. And then the SBDs, <clears throat> the SBDs take off later and they they wind up dealing with what's left of Ichiki's people on the other end of the Alligator Creek, if I'm not mistaken. But Regardless of this, this is the first instance of combat that these guys are receiving, and it's it's you know very haphazard as it's going to be through the rest of the campaign. Is that they're literally thrown up in the air and they're going. And yeah, there's coast watchers, and we do have a radar station that comes up on the island later on, and all that kind of stuff. But tell us about this first combat with these guys on the 21st, and then of course we'll get to Eastern Solomon's. That that's what three days later. That that's a big deal. But this first combat, John. What's what's going on with these guys here? Well, first, Marine Aviation was 0 and 3 going into mm -hmm. uh, going into Guadalcanal. So uh, they lost all but one aircraft on the ground during the Pearl Harbor attack at Eva. And then mm -hmm. uh, 220, uh, VMF 211 was wiped out at Wake Island. Uh, and, and the guys uh, who survived ended up uh, fighting as infantry on the on the beach until the garrison surrendered. And then you have Midway, where the two squadrons, Marine squadrons there, were, were virtually wiped out. So going in, the odds didn't look good, and, and, uh, and the first day of combat actually reinforced that. And it's odd how the secondary sources uh, generally handle this first battle, because um, John L. was on a, basically a presence patrol, and he had taken one of his Ivy Leaguers, or maybe two of his I Ivy Leaguers with him, and an experienced NAP uh, uh, aviator named John Lindley. So he took two promising second lieutenants that he trusted, uh, and uh, one of the senior uh, and most experienced Marines in the squadron with him on this first patrol. And they ran into um, a flight of zeros from the Tainan Air Group led by uh, a guy who was known as the Richtofen of Rabal, Junichi Sasai, I probably mm -hmm. butchered his first name. Um, and in the ensuing fight, a couple of things happen. Um, all four of the Wildcats get shot up badly and Lindley gets wounded. And the response is, wow, we can really uh, trust the F4F because it can take a pounding. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so, so that was the positive they took away from the, the experience. But the truth was uh, they got bounced by a superior force at, uh, that had altitude and they were lucky to survive, very lucky to survive. And they could have been wiped out. I mean, it was, um, uh, it was a, it was a, really really bad fight for the marines that first day uh and 
And three of the aircraft were knocked out and a couple of them weren't flyable for almost two weeks. And Lindley, uh, Lindley's experience kind of mirrored a lot of the guys later on. And that was as he was fighting and trying to shake the zeros off his tail, uh, he lost, um, or he, he got hit from the rear and the, um, the armor plating on the Wildcat was enough to protect the pilot, but the rounds that were coming from behind ended up um, uh, hitting his oil system mm -hmm. and it, it poured oil. And here she is uh, guys, always wanting attention. Go away. <laughs> um, and she's back. Okay. She's going to probably opine on this mission too. Uh <laughs> She has a lot of thoughts on 53 days because she was with me like this when I wrote it um, every day. Uh, anyway, um, so Lindley got hit in the oil system mm -hmm. and it sprayed hot oil all over him in the cockpit and gave him significant burns uh, along his face and hands. And he was very badly wounded, knocked out of action. He flew one other or a couple other missions and then was evacuated. Uh, and his missions that he flew came later after he had kind of partially recovered. But I mean, these were, uh, uh, these were significant burns and it happens over and over and over again. Um, the wildcat really, you know, everybody talks about how rugged it was. This was definitely a weak point and the guys would, would come back covered in oil. And if they had their, um, uh, their, um, goggles up above their forehead it could create uh significant um you know issues for them Side blind issue. them yeah uh mm -hmm. blind them and and cause lasting damage so it was a uh, oh, thank god she's gone <laughs> um, uh so that first battle was uh, was a wake-up call they yeah. learned that their their gear was rugged but they literally got their um uh, their tails kicked in by the Tainan Air Group, which isn't surprising given the fact that, you know, the most experienced Marine in that flight was John L. Smith. And up until the previous year, he'd been a dive bomber pilot. So it wasn't like he had anywhere near the experience of, of uh, the guys uh, flying in the Tainan Air Group that day. Some of those guys have been flying since 1937. And, and in fact, later on, they run into pilots who'd been flying since the early 30s and had been in you know, dog fights throughout the thirties. Well, most of the Marines on, on Guadalcanal were, you know, playing for their junior varsity teams in high school. Yeah. And that's, that's something to, to, to think about too. You know, we think about American fighter pilots in the Guadalcanal campaign and I'm talking about Navy and Marines and we, we hold them in very high regard because of the fact that they did survive. However, as you alluded to, uh, as you said at the beginning, these guys, these particular guys on cact in ca on cactus, um, these marine fighter pilots specifically did not have a whole lot of experience. So that experience that was gained by the Navy fighter pilots, by guys in VF six or VF three, Jimmy Thatch's people like that, that wasn't able to be shared because they didn't have that time to meld that information into these Marines. Not that they would have been able to in the first place because they weren't anywhere near each other, but that institutional knowledge that was building within the United States Navy was unable to be shared with the United States Marine Corps aviators because they just didn't simply have the time or the ability to do so. So the lessons that Jimmy Thatch and people like that had learned and the tactics that they had learned had not been disseminated to these Marines. So these guys really really did have to start and learn everything on the fly no pun intended that they yeah. literally had to learn everything as it was going along and it was it was kill or be killed you know from the minute they rise up in the air here 100 that's such a good point seth because you know everybody talks about the thatch weave and and mm -hmm. you know mutual protection and all sure. that these guys they didn't have the uh the sophistication yet to even be able to do those things. They were still learning to fly in formation in an F4F, you know? Um, and John L recognized it. And one of the things that makes him in my mind, such an incredible leader. When, when I was in Afghanistan, I was, I was with a task force commander named Raul, R Lieutenant Colonel Rob Alt. And uh, Colonel Alt was one of the greatest officers I've ever encountered. And he did the same thing with his men and women uh, that John L did 
in the in the month before they ended up uh, loading aboard the Long Island. And that was he knew he didn't have time to train to all of the tasks required of him. So both Alt and John L narrowed it down to just a couple of things that they could do super, super well and that they had trained to um, as thoroughly as they could do it. And what John L focused on was bomber interception with overhead runs and time after time, after time, as they were flying those training missions uh, in July, that's what he was teaching his guys to do shoot and carry out these overhead passes. So he was working with deflection shooting techniques and teaching them aerial gunnery. That was the other major um, uh, skill set he was trying to build in his men. And it paid off because they really did um, uh, take a, a very heavy toll of the Japanese. Uh, but so, yeah, there was no training to the thatch weave. And in fact, it's not until the end of September that there's any reference of that I found anyway of the Marines that I was writing about carrying out any kind of mutual support weaving techniques. And I think the reason for that is you start getting Navy squadrons in uh, fighter squadrons into Guadalcanal, like VF five. And those guys were talking with the Marines and showing them what to do. And, and they learned on the job at Guadalcanal from, from the orphaned uh, Navy units that came in. Right. Of which there were many. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We, we talked about him. We've mentioned his name now probably a half a dozen times. I haven't been counting, but he's one of the central characters in your book. Uh, he is still to this day, should be remembered as the legend that he was. And that's John L. Smith, John L., as he was called. Uh, he was born in Oklahoma. Um, he was a ROTC grad. He joined the Corps in, what, 36? So he'd been around a while. Tell us about John L. Smith. I mean, this guy is, he was incredible, abs incredible leader. He is the, literally the exact type of person that these young pilots needed in that squadron for this campaign at this time. If the good Lord would have put a better man in there, I'd, I'd like to know who it would have been. Tell us about John L. Smith. Yeah, there, there wasn't a better one. And the, the irony of the situation, Seth, is in his evaluation reports, there was, um, uh, references made that there was concern that he was too emotional for combat and john <laughs> l several times on guadalcanal very bitterly remarked about those uh evaluation reports um but the truth of the matter is he, he was an emotional guy i mean you talk to anybody who knew him he was uh he was hot and cold he had a temper on him it, he would get indignant if his uh if his pilots were were um being unfairly treated by somebody else uh he would go to bat for him and it didn't matter what uh damage that did to his career mm -hmm. or how annoyed his superiors were he he was 100 loyal to him and because of that um his men absolutely worshipped him i mean there was nothing uh, that I have ever found that any of the guys wrote from two to three about their skipper that was negative. They loved him. Uh, so, so right out the bat, they've got a guy who's a natural leader and, and this is his first squadron command. And in fact, he was chosen for the command above guys who had been in um, the service longer and had been in, in time and rank longer. Uh, so there was some resentment around the fact that he was even given a squadron when when he was uh, when he took over two two three in the early spring of forty two. So um, he started this whole campaign with some questions about whether or not he was really up for the task, and there were other leaders at the time who were in the exact same situation. And some of them didn't really measure up. Uh, there was a dive bomber skipper who was heavily criticized later on, uh, Leo Smith from VMSB 231 for the way he um, uh, he conducted himself. So, so you know, he goes in with not really a cloud, but there's definitely questions about him. And when he realized 
uh, you know, he wasn't a spit and polished guy, but he was a taskmaster and he was a disciplinarian. But when he looked at who he had in his squadron, he realized that he couldn't be that. He, he couldn't do it because these guys that were coming in from, from uh, the States had been, you know, fraternity kids a year before. They didn't go to the basic school. They didn't go through any kind of Marine Corps um, specific training. The reason they actually became Marines were they were, they were all top 10% of their training classes and the top 10% of, of the cadets were all given the opportunity to go to the Marine Corps. So, uh, you know, they were the best of the best of the training, uh, schools, uh, that the training schools, uh, you know, produced, uh, but still they're grass green and they're kind of Marines in name only. So, uh, John L realized pretty quickly that he had to treat them differently. And he bred a familiarity in that squadron that, that really surprised me. Like the guys were using each other's nicknames, no matter what their rank. Um, I don't want to say that there wasn't, um, that the, that the, you know, the distinction of rank was blurred, but there was an informality there in 223 that didn't exist in VMSB 232. Mangrum ran his squadron a lot more uh, traditionally and, and paid very close attention to the, you know, uh, stratification of rank. Uh, that wasn't the case with John L. And you look at the photos that survived from their time on Guadalcanal. He's one of the guys he's drinking with them. He's hanging out with them. Uh, and that, you know, for a pre-war officer, uh, that's a pretty unusual thing. And he did it because he knew that these kids, needed that kind of environment in order to gel and it worked and, it, John, and there's it, another character it, though the, go ahead i'm sorry no go ahead, so, go ahead i was gonna say there's another character that looms large not just in your book but in marine corps aviation history and his name is marion carl <laughs> what can you tell us about captain carl marion carl is one of the most impressive human beings i've ever met and he is the reason why i wrote this book um so I was a grad student in 1991 with a mullet and Coke bottle mm -hmm. glasses <laughs> and a 1956 Ford Victoria. Oh man, my wedding photos from that era. Oh, so <laughs> sad. What was I thinking? Anyway, um, I was a grad student at the University of Oregon and I wanted to write my master's thesis on uh, how effective naval aviation training was, pre-war naval aviation training was. Uh, as shown by what happened in the first eight months of the Pacific War. Mm -hmm. And to that end, I wrote to everybody who would, uh, that I could find in Oregon um, in driving range who I might be able to interview about their experiences in the pre-war Corps or Navy. And uh, General Carl was one of them. And you got to keep in mind, uh, the University of Oregon did not have a great reputation among veterans after uh, Vietnam in the 70s. Uh, I like this was a school that, you know, torched its ROTC building. <laughs> so uh, General Carl took a huge risk and invited me down to his house. And I drove my little 56 Ford down and spent the day with him on the river outside of Roseburg on the Umpqua. Uh, talking to him and interviewing him. And he, he became the first of about 1500 veterans I interviewed over the course of the next 15 years or so. And um, he was tall, soft-spoken, but his word was law. Like you could just tell, I mean, he had such a command presence and a sense, just an air of authority. And he was completely comfortable within his skin um, this was a man who was, I mean, just so self-possessed and mm -hmm. you could tell, I mean, like total gentleman at the same time, solid steel underneath solid steel. And this was a guy, you know, who had, who had set records. He had become mm -hmm. the first Marine Corps ace. He, he had a, a, a record and a career that rivaled Chuck Yeager's and was nowhere near as well known. And he didn't care about that. It, the, the accolades and the, uh, and the media attention was something that he really just sort of viewed with contempt. He just wanted to do the job. 
Mm-hmm. And he was one of the survivors from Midway who joined John L. Smith. And he knew him uh, because Smith had been in the same unit with him on Midway until he, he was pulled back to Hawaii to take over VMF 223. So when Marion arrived and, and joined John L in 223 in July, um, John L sat him down and picked his brain and said, okay, what happened at Midway? What do we need to do? And uh, initially Marion became his operations officer. And then after Rivers Morrell was wounded, he became uh, John L's XO. And he is really, you know, each squadron had their own lug nut uh, personality. And Marion Carl was one of the lug nuts. And he became not just a pivotal figure in the squadron, but a pivotal figure uh, for the morale of the Marines on the ground because of a couple of engagements where they saw him actually shoot a Japanese plane down. And uh, there was just... um, reverence towards Marion Carl as a result. He was the best of the best on the island for sure. He and John L had a bit of a as things get going and 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 they the Marines do start to find success, significant success too, by the way. Um he and Marion Carl and John L kind of have a little bit of a rivalry. Now in your book that we talked about before when we were talking about Bong and Tommy McGuire, there was a genuine you know, back and forth there. How realistic was the rivalry per se uh, again with with John L and and Mary and Carl? I, I think they were naturally competitive guys. Sure, but sure. Uh, and and so yeah, I think they were. Uh, it was a friendly rivalry, uh, mm-hmm. uh, is the way I would characterize it. And it was, it definitely took a back seat to survival and keeping the other pilots alive. It wasn't like what happened uh, in the fifth air force where things got completely uh, out of control, you know, and, and uh, I (laughs) wrote about that at length, how off the rails, the competition went. Um, These two guys uh, not only respected and liked each other, they became lifelong friends as a result of, of their Guadalcanal deployment, uh, which plays into John L's life later on. Um, when he uh when he suffers a, a breakdown uh as far as the rivalry goes john l gained the lead and surpassed marion's score of confirmed kills uh while marion carl was escaping and evading in the jungle after he got shot down and in, in uh during the second week of september and so for five days, Marion was out of action because he was trying to get back to the perimeter. And when he got back, he, uh, he discovered that John L had gotten ahead of him. And his response was, uh, you know, there's this, this classic line that Marion is supposed to have said, which was, damn it, General, can't you just ground Smitty for five days so I can catch up? Uh, but that was actually somebody, some staff officer at the uh, at the Pagoda where the air operations uh, staff had set up shop. He had actually said that uh, Marion's comment was, well, I guess I'm going to have to get to work then. You know, that's <laughs> very, very Mary Carl. It was just kind of matter of fact. OK, I got to catch up. Um, and the two of them, uh, you know, they they were the two high scorers. Um Marion ends up with uh, 16.5 and uh, what John L had 19, 18 mm-hmm. and 19 mm-hmm. and becomes the um, America's ace of aces for the time being uh, just because mm-hmm. of these 53 days. I mean, it's an extraordinarily um, kaleidoscoped uh, combat deployment where, I, I mean, they were flying and fighting every day with very few breaks i mean the weather would give them a break here and there and then uh, after bloody ridge there was a little bit of a lull and then the japanese came back with even greater force so it was um uh it was a target rich environment and both marion and and john l made the most of it but the thing you got to keep in mind about this whole period is when you look at the actual squadron 223 pretty much everybody I think I think we figured out there was only one or two pilots that hadn't been shot down, but Marion got shot down, uh, John L got shot down, 
Rivers Morrell crash landed. Everybody either crash landed or bailed out of an airplane, except for one or two of the original pilots. It was, um, it, it was an incredible um, meat grinder for them, for sure. And you talked about this pleasant stroll that Marion took through the jungle, um, this saunter. You, you know, <laughs> it was like 25 miles, wasn't it, through enemy oh, yeah. territory? And uh, wouldn't most people be happy to be alive rather than saying, oh, I better, I got to catch up on my kills. <laughs> yes. Oh man. There, there's uh that, that whole story of his, his escape and evasion uh, is just remarkable. I mean, the guys who were able to get in uh, they all came back with just amazing stories. Uh, but Marion ended up in the water. He was trying to, shoot down some Japanese bombers that were attacking one of the very first major reinforcement convoys to come in. And I, I believe this, this was the one that was bringing in the uh, seventh Marines. Seventh Marines. Yep. Oh no, you know, I take it back. It was not, it was the mm -hmm. one before the seventh Marines came in. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the Japanese had seen them and had diverted away from the airfield to go get, to go get them. And, Marion violated uh, John L's strict law of air combat, which was one pass, two if you can get away with it, and that's it, uh, and then run for home. Uh, and to try to keep the, uh, the, the ship safe, he tried a third pass, and he and Lindley, I, I mean, uh, Clayton Canfield, his wingmen were both shot down. And Canfield was fished out real close to the convoy pretty quickly, but Marion drifted. Uh, he ended up um, in a very remote section of, of Guadalcanal in the water, and he refused to dump his 45 and his shoes because he realized he would need them both. But uh, they were heavy enough to make sure that he couldn't make progress against the current. And he was in the water for a couple of hours and was losing strength when a, um, a Melanesian uh, came out in a canoe and rescued him. And uh, Eroni was his name. Eroni helped him uh, get uh, to a, to his village. They, they nursed him back to health. And then they tried to uh, make the trip overland. And as they were going through the jungle to try to get back to the perimeter, uh, a Japanese patrol went through the village and, and uh, essentially stole all the food that the villagers possessed. And so um, as they're in the middle of this jungle trek uh, and the Japanese are behind them, uh, a bunch of Melanesian uh, uh, locals uh, show up running the other way down the trail and tell them they're Japanese right behind them. So they, they're basically trapped. Uh, so they turned around and, and went back to Aroni's village and waited in for the Japanese to, to leave. And then um, uh, Marion was able to get a, uh, a, a small boat and its engine running it hadn't been functional for months and the villagers had kept it concealed he gets it running uh because he, he was a you know kind of a mechanical mechanical savant and loved to tinker with small motors um he gets it running and they actually um run up along the coast uh during the uh, battle of bloody ridge uh at night um to get back to the perimeter and and he gets back uh, and the first thing that happens is he goes and reports in and, and word spread like wildfire that Marion was back. I mean, this was a huge blow to the squadron because when he got shot down and went missing, uh, he was the last of the senior leaders besides John L because Rivers Morrell had been, uh, the XO had been shot down and wounded. Uh, so he had been evacuated. So it was just John L essentially running the squadron with a bunch of guys who were second lieutenants. And, and it was um, a very, very perilous time. And they lost several guys while, uh, while Marion was in the, in the jungle. You know, one of the points we've made multiple, multiple times is that during the war, the United States, uh, and we just got better at it, rescuing our people and in some way, shape or form, getting our people when they went down, fighter pilots, dive bomber pilots, didn't matter. Uh, when they went down, we had a really good handle on getting our people back to safety, whereas the Japanese did not. 
Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons, of course, for their demise after Guadalcanal is, is that you know, we kill a lot of their guys. And our guys are still there. They're still around. Now, obviously, Marion Carl's a little bit of a different circumstance because he you know, made his way back. But there are multiple, multiple examples of these guys being fished out of the water, being brought, brought back, and, and their expertise is not lost. And talking about expertise... Let's talk about it, because these guys, as we, we've already said, they, they come into this campaign green as grass. They don't know, you know anything from anything. And in a relatively short amount of time, they start stacking the kills. They really do. And yes, most of it is, I don't want to say most, but a, a lion's share of it is John L. and Mary and Carl and people, you know, but there's other guys who start making their rep pretty quick. And, two tw- and, and, and the, they start really stacking the kills pretty fast and when they do get done they have an impressive record in the amount of time you know and but but let's talk about this i mean they really start piling them up real quick john uh for sure and part of it was they were in a target rich environment sure part of it was the way that uh, that uh, john l trained them which was focus on the gunnery focus on uh the overhead passes and the overhead passes minimized their um, chances of being hit by uh, the rear gunners on the Japanese bombers. Uh, it required high deflection. You had to be um, really, really on the ball to pull this off, but they worked it and worked it and worked it. So when you look at the flight logs of the guys uh, from 223, you know, they flew somewhere between 40 and 60 hours in the time that they had in July. I like really uh, John L flew the wings off of these guys and this is all they did. They shot target, uh, uh, sleeves and they did overhead passes. Uh, and so when they got to the Island, that's exactly what they ended up doing. They would be, uh, stacked up, you know, 25, 27,000 feet. And they'd roll in on these, uh, Japanese Bettys that were at 20,000 in tight, via v's and the japanese fighter units because they couldn't communicate with the bombers they didn't have radios in their zeros for the most part um the japanese zeros were usually out of place just enough that the marines were able to get one or two passes at most in before they were able to wade in and 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 protect the bombers and so uh very quickly Guys like Zen Pond and Charlie Kendrick and Ken Frazier and Fred Goot, uh, they all started, uh, you're right, racking the kills up. And you see that the top 10% of these um, training classes from Pensacola and Corpus Christi were actually really good pilots. They just needed more time uh, to, to hone their craft and learn their airplanes. And, you know, when you look back at how quickly they they were trained and um, how quickly they were thrown into the fight. If they had been given a proper workup, <laughs> those guys would have been um, unbeatable. Yeah. As it is, they went they went up against the you know you could argue that the Japanese of 1942 were the most experienced combat aviators in the world. They'd been flying some of them for over a decade in combat, yeah. and um, you know these were these were kids from rural Michigan and, and rural Florida or from, you know, the halls of Yale and Princeton and Stanford and Harvard law. Uh, And, and they fought them to a standstill. You know, you can argue that these 53 days uh, the Marines didn't win, but they didn't lose. And they set the table for the ultimate victory on Guadalcanal. And and the fact that they did that is amazing. No doubt. No doubt. Go Harvard ahead. Law guy was that Richard Mangrum? No, uh, Mangrum was actually uh, UW Law. Uh, Charlie okay. Kendrick was was the Harvard Law kid, and, and and this 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 kid they call him Red Kendrick. He had red hair. Um, red Kendrick was was a native San Franciscan from a very uh, elite family in San Francisco. Very wealthy. Uh, he was a prodigy. He went to Stanford at age 16 and became a linguist and learned seven languages, graduated at age 20 and went on to Harvard Law. And while he was at Harvard Law, he saw the writing on the wall with the, you know, the the, uh, world situation and uh, decided he wanted to be a a pilot and went and joined the, the Navy 
and then you know he went through the training program and he was top 10 percent. so uh he went marine corps so you got this combination of like ivy league blue bloods and dirt poor farm boys that must have caused some friction it, it was a remarkable diverse crew when you look at the the actual people um behind the names you know you see the names in the in the secondary sources in the documents and the memoirs guys like Louis Masius and and uh, 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 you know um, Don McCafferty and and Charlie Kendrick and and uh, Scotty McLennan these these guys were as diverse a bunch as as you could get in 1942 and yet something really remarkable happened to them when they were on the ships uh, on their way to Hawaii, they were thrown together and uh, literally the only thing they had in common was, uh, were the facts, uh, the fact that they were Americans, they were Marines in uniform, they loved to fly and they loved women. Uh, and th those four things kept them, talking through that entire voyage from San Diego to, uh, uh, to Oahu. And they bonded on that trip, or at least the, the, the foundation of the bonds started on the, on that voyage. But the other thing that I discovered along the way was that some of these guys already knew each other. So, um, Bailey and pond, two of the pilots in, in VMF 223, met at Jackson Community College in Michigan, bought a plane together, went through CPT training, um, and both of them decided to join the, the Navy at the same time. Pond went first, Bailey entered, uh, or pa Bailey went first, and then Pond went about a month later. And they ended up in different training classes, but they ended up in the same squadron. And these were guys who'd known each other for, for years prior to the war. So you had those relationships already built in uh to the squadrons when when uh when they arrived and that was the case uh in in dick mangrum's unit too with some of the uh the pilots that he got they had gone through training together or some of them had even known each other in, in uh the pre-war uh era so despite the diversity despite the socioeconomic divisions within them uh there was a remarkable amount of gelling and friendship that developed very quickly among the guys where you see the distinction and the division is really when the midway pilots were injected into uh, the squadrons and the the midway crews had such a different outlook and and were so fatalistic, especially in Mangrum's unit. Uh, Danny Iverson was one of the pilots that Mangrum got from uh, 241. And he had not only watched Lofton Hedrison die um, during the raid on the Kido Butai on June 4th, but he had been wounded and his aircraft came back with what, 200 plus bullet mm -hmm. holes? It still exists. It's in Pensacola. Pensacola, yep. Um, Tom Moore was, was shot up. Um, so, uh, and, and he was one of the midway guys. So there was, um, that's where the distinction and the, and the difference was and where those two clicks within the squadron started to, to gel and come together, uh, was after Fiji when the second lieutenants who were, you know, you know all gung ho talking about all the ships they were going to sink and all the Japanese they were going to kill, um, when they realized what they were up against and just it started to dawn on them just how big of a pickle they were in, that's when they started going and sitting at the feet of the Midway veterans and starting to pick their brains and learn everything they could. So ultimately they did gel. Um, but um, uh, for, for the first part of the, their time together, the, the Midway guys were actually kind of a problem with in, in both, both squadrons. They were also very, very lucky to have lug nut type uh, members of the squadron. You know, I mentioned Mary and Carl, but in 232, there was an enlisted pilot by the name of uh, Larry Baldinus. He had been with the unit for, I think, two years as uh, first as ground echelon. Then he got a, um, uh, a billet to flight school 
as an NAP. So he was an enlisted pilot. And he, he was one of the very few pre-war members of the squadron still with Dick Mangrum in July. And uh, Dick decided, you know, with his new guys, he needed a second lieutenant who could show these guys the ropes, who was of the same rank and could mentor them along at the same time, because he didn't have the first lieutenants that knew how a squadron operated. Um, you know, every department head has responsibilities from your ordnance officer to your, you know, uh, uh, parachute officer, your armaments officer. Everybody has responsibilities beyond just flying, right? These guys didn't know the first thing about that, but Baldiness did because he'd been a Marine for so long. So uh, Mangrum had him commissioned as a second lieutenant and he took a pay cut as a result. And he was the the voice of institutional knowledge in the barracks with the second lieutenants and he's the one that that um essentially showed these guys the ropes and how to be marines and how to be marine officers and and so he's one of these unique characters who is not only beloved by the officers but the enlisted guys in 232 mm -hmm. revered him. him they loved him yeah B before we get to the dive bombers i, I want to and we're going to talk about mangram because he needs to be spoken about. But I want to jump back real quick to something you said and that we you said just a minute ago that we've said a gazillion times is that the killing that is done by the fighter pilots on Cactus here, not just the Marines either, obviously, by the way, but the Navy pilots that were there too. And then, of course, the Navy that's off offshore flying off of Enterprise and Hornet and Saratoga and Wasp and all that. These are the guys that kill Japanese aviation. They do. That that turning point of the war and everybody you know it, it wasn't one event it was a conglomeration of multiple events that turned the tide of the war but it happened here at guadalcanal and it's because of guys like this it's because of the stack and the kills that they're dropping these aviators who to your point exactly were in 1942 the japanese naval aviators and 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 army aviators were among the most experienced aviators in the world. And, and I've always said that the, the Japanese naval aviators were probably the finest pilots in the world in 1942. And I, it'd be hard to argue against that. It really would. And and these guys, like you're saying, these farm boys and blue bloods and everything, they're, they're coming in here and they are killing these guys. And they're the ones that are reversing that tide. It's not just the Marines, but in large part, especially here at Cactus on Cactus, it is these guys because they set the precedent for the people that follow. And I think that's that's what's so important is that we talked about the Navy not being a not being able to really um, transfer their knowledge until some of them start getting a getting a, a left on Henderson Field. Well, these Marines are giving their knowledge to the guys that come after them. And, and that's huge because, I mean, the secondary title of your book is The Battle That Saved Marine Corps Aviation. And it's the success of these guys, these fighter pilots specifically that allowed that Marine Corps aviation to not only survive, but flourish in World War II. And it's the experience that they gain here by killing the finest aviators in the world in 1942. So 100%. let's talk about, but go, go ahead, John, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was hundred percent agree with you. And the, the thing that really strikes me about this group that pulled this off, I mean, these guys, you want to talk about bootstrapping of victory. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everything went wrong on this, on this yes. island, everything. Yep. And what carried them through was leadership, grit, determination. There were very few pilots who couldn't hack it or uh, look for ways to avoid it. Um, I wrote about one of them and there's really just only one. And he was in VMF uh, 223 as a temporary, um, uh, temporarily assigned pilot right at the beginning of the, of the campaign. But I mean, what does this say on a larger level as to who we are as, as a people? I mean, here we could take average ordinary Americans, give them minimal training, throw them into an impossible situation and they do the impossible. I mean, that just says so much about who we are. And I think we forget that because we are also a people who obsesses over our skeletons in our collective national closet. You know, we're yep. part of part of, you know, the, the American Revolution has it's a double edged sword. We're 
always seeking to be better. We're always seeking to advance. You know, the revolution's been going on for 200 years plus. And yet at the same time, we're so hard on ourselves nationally that I think we lose track of the good things that we've yeah. done and the good things we are. And, and these guys, I mean, my gosh, part of the reason I wrote this book was I watched my son's generation. Uh, he's Gen Z. Uh, these boys grew up in an environment where they were culturally bombarded with how awful uh, being a male is. <laughs> like you know uh, and and you wonder why they're having issues now is they're you know achieving adulthood um i had to work with my son over and over and over again it's something you know, don't listen to the that's just background chatter go be you yeah. but a lot of these kids these young men they never really had that um that level of support but this is and so so i wrote this book in part for them because you know these are their peers from 80 years ago. These are the challenges that they faced. And, you know, I'm not going to diminish anybody's personal challenges uh, here and now and today. I mean, Gen Z is going through stuff that none of us have ever experienced. And yet we continue to disparage them. But the reality is our Gen Z, they're the legacy of the, the greatest generation through the boomers and the Gen Xers. We're all of the same TNA. We are all Americans. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book was to show them this is in you. This is in your national character. This is in your heritage. And these guys who turned the tide at a remote place that nobody had ever heard of, they set the standard yeah. for all of us. For everybody that followed you know? 100 percent. so i'm so glad you mentioned that seth thank you so you said it before and and we'll say it again the fighter pilots and bill and i've talked about this a gazillion times the fighter pilots mm -hmm. always get the headlines and they do and the fighter pilots are sexy that's top gun i mean come on let's be real but anybody who knows anything about the pacific war especially 1942 knows that the vast majority of ship killing was done with and little plane made in El Segundo by Douglas <laughs> Aircraft called the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber. My hands down favorite aircraft of the entire war because it's just awesome. One of the squadrons, the first SBD squadron that lands on Cactus Air Force is led by a guy who nobody ever talks about, yet was just as instrumental, even, maybe even more so than John L. Smith and turning the tide of this entire friggin' campaign because he was leading the squadron of SBDs that's killing these transports coming in. He's leading the squadron of SBDs that's going in there and laying licks on Japanese warships after these battles or during these battles and in and, and some way, shape, or form. And that's Dick Mangrum. That's a guy that nobody ever talks about, and we need to talk about him. John, who was Mangrum? Mangrum was a Seattle native who went to the University of Washington in the 20s and then went on to law school, became a Marine Reserve uh, aviator, uh, flew all through. So in 1929, he joined the Corps, um, flew all the way through the 30s, flew off of every aircraft carrier, had been... Um, you know, flying biplanes long before uh, most of the guys that he commanded at Guadalcanal had even uh, gotten out of elementary school. And uh, he was a very polished, very uh, low-key officer who had the intellectual acuity of a true genius. Like I tried to read some of his post-war articles that he wrote um, I, I don't have the, the gigahertz in my brain to process the level <laughs> that he was at. I mean, he was operating, uh, I mean, well above your average, uh, law school professor. I mean, just, I, I it, it was shocking how much, uh, uh, this guy's brain has <laughs> probably weighed 20 or 30 pounds. Um, yeah, no, he was, he was a brilliant man. He was very polished. Uh, when they went on the hero tour, which is actually composes the first part of the book, um, uh, John L. and Marion basically just let Mangrum speak for them. 
uh, because he was so polished and he did have the ability to uh, interact in a way that that John L and, and especially Marion didn't. Uh, and that translated into a low key style of leadership that was at the same time very inspirational. And when you look at the survivors from 232, they walked away with the same sort of reverence that uh, 223 had for John L. Smith. Uh, and that was because time after time after time, Mangram led the way. He was the tip of the spear for Guadalcanal over and over and over again uh, for the Cactus Air Force. And on, on crucial missions, uh, he ended up displaying a level of devotion and courage that, that went way above and beyond anything else. And at the same time, as he's sitting there, you know, willing to share every risk and actually take on more risk than uh, most of what he was asking for his own men, um, he had this ability to connect with his men without becoming as personal with them as John L. did with his guys in 223. And because of that, uh, the Red Devils of 232 were a little bit more formally run, uh, but that did not actually detract at all from the way they operated. And that was very much in part because of, uh, of Larry Baldinus. Uh, Baldinus becomes really the, the hub and the glue that holds the squadron together. And so that tactical move that Mangrum made by get, getting him commissioned uh, it turns out to be one of the most important steps to, to keep the squadron functional in the worst moments. And so, so that's a little bit about Mangrum. And, you know, he goes on uh, after this deployment, he becomes the leader of the Corps of Cadets at Corpus Christi. So he's in charge of training the next, uh, uh, next generation. generation. Yeah. And time after time, the guys from 232 show up at Corpus at one point or another, and they have these really remarkable reunions. And, it, you know, it's not just because of what he did uh, for, the, for his men on Guadalcanal, but when he got home, he was very conscientious about making sure his guys were given the appropriate level of awards that they deserved for their time on the island. And a lot of COs, I think, um, overlooked that. They just went on to different assignments, uh, not Mangrum. He wanted to make absolutely certain that his guys got what they, they had earned. And over and over again, you see the level of appreciation for that reflected in how they interacted after the deployment. And some of them, mm -hmm. you know, they became lifelong friends. Uh, and at the same time, Mangrum gets dissed constantly and so mm -hmm. does 232 you know you you look at you look at the story and and the you know in in our culture of of uh, aviation historians and aviation uh fans and and you know fans of our history you see 232 show up uh in the in the literature during eastern solomon's when they stop the first uh transport force mm -hmm. and then they show up again in on august 28th when they stop another transport or a, a basically a tokyo express run of fast of uh, fast destroyers destroyers so you see mangrum show up twice and his guys are are mentioned and you know the losses that they they suffered are mentioned what you don't see is what happened after in September, which actually plays a significant, and I would argue a more significant role in stopping the first Japanese counteroffensive on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the first real one. I mean, the cheeky was, you know, yeah, he went off half cocked. Right. Um, but Kawaguchi, he had a, he had a master plan that could have succeeded had he had his full brigade with him. Oh, yeah. Um, but as, as you may know, uh, they decided after the August 28th uh, uh, attack, turned back the Tokyo Express, um, they decided to start running uh, what they called it, ant freight mm -hmm. convoys down, mm -hmm. basically little barge uh, convoys uh, from the central Solomons down to Guadalcanal. It was a technique that they used in uh, uh, in Borneo when they were taking Balikpapan and some of the other major uh, coastal 
areas in in the Dutch East Indies, and using these barges and and landing craft to basically scuttle along the coastlines of these uh, small islands between the central Solomons and Guadalcanal seemed like a really great idea. You know, you could hide during the day, move during the night, and you, you could be very stealthy. Well, uh, Mangrum's pilots very quickly discovered them and began attacking them. And over the course of the next uh, week and a half or so, they were able to scatter those convoys. And those guys, first off, they killed or, or wounded about 300 of them in the attacks. And, and 232 was not the only unit at this point that was you know, carrying these attacks out, but they were the spear. They were the tip of the spear. And in every one of these attacks, there were members of the squadron either leading it or had significant um, uh, positions within the attack force, the strike force. Uh, so, so there were about 1,200 uh, Japanese troops involved in this, in, uh, this movement, and 300 of them were killed or wounded, and their supplies were scattered. The survivors of these attacks were, some of them were on Savo Island for days. Some of them were trapped at uh, Santa Isabella or other spots. Um, they were, they did not arrive on Guadalcanal as an integrated fighting force. They arrived as shipwreck survivors. And that made a huge difference. And the ones Tremendous. that even, yeah, got there, ended up on the west side of the perimeter and never were able to get to Kawaguchi in the first place uh, because he had been, He'd been on the east side of the perimeter and moving to the south side to attack uh, Edson's Ridge. And, and so without those guys, without those supplies, and without that uh, integrated fighting force, uh, Kawaguchi's offensive failed. So I really think that uh, what Mangrum did and his squadron did was uh, save the perimeter with the interdiction that they were able to accomplish with an aircraft that as good as the SBD was, it had some pretty significant drawbacks. One of the one of the most important of which, especially when dealing with the barges, was that their forward firing 50 calibers were not uh, functional on most of the of the airframes by early September. There were there were all sorts of issues with the synchronizing gear, and it took um, way too much maintenance time that the ground echelon didn't have to get those things back into operation. So they were forced to sink those barges by developing new tactics, which they called the wagon wheel, where they would just fly around the barges. And ex yeah, accepting the incoming ground fire or barge fire um, in order to uh, um, strafe them with the backseat gunners uh, uh, twin thirties. So mm -hmm. it was a, it was a rough, rough deployment. And yet at the same time, uh, you never hear about the importance of this. I mean, it's just such a vital part of the early portion of the campaign. And so I really wanted to highlight that in 53 days and tell that story and, and what these guys did. And when, when um, Thomas Miller's book, Cactus Air Force, came out, I mean, I read that book as a kid and I loved it. And this cat is driving me nuts um i i read that book i mean it's it's the gold bar standard that everybody is measured up against um but in the in the letters that i have between mangrum and dennis bird is gunner mm -hmm. uh mangrum makes a point of saying you know the true story of our squadron is never really going to be told at this point i don't think it can be because so many of us are gone so I really kind of took that on as a personal mission to try to um, resurrect the accomplishment and the, you know, the, the memory and the legacy of the Red Devils. Mm -hmm. So that, that whole aspect, and, and part of it, because I knew Dennis Bird, I was friends with him, uh, and I, I wanted to do right by all the things that he did for me in the 90s when I, was, when I first met him. And that's Thank really you. been our primary mission all along in this podcast is to do right by the guys that did these things. You know, to summarize the action, you know, these guys are credited with destroying 17 enemy ships, uh, not just this one squadron, but Cactus Air Force, right? Including Hie, Kunagasa, one cruiser, three destroyers, 12 transports. They damaged a further 18. They really made a major impact. 
And, you know, that they were rewarded to some extent. You know, six medals of honor, including John L., but not Marion and not Dick. <laughs> What's up with that? Oh, man. Uh, Bob Kaler, who was the skipper of 224, mm -hmm. uh, wrote very bitterly in his diary about um, the early stages of that. So mm -hmm. uh, end of September, early October, Nimitz flies into right. Guadalcanal. Um, this is a pretty big deal because Gormley, who was in overall command. Never did. Never did. Never did. So Nimitz, Nimitz was basically showing how it needed to be done. He comes right. in and he wanted to um, decorate some of the Marines who deserved it. So they have this sort of award ceremony and um, Mary Carl, uh, John L., Bob Gaylor, they all receive Navy crosses from Nimitz. And then when uh, Nimitz calls Richard Mangrum forward, he awards him a distinguished flying cross. Uh, he's he's a skipper too. Why didn't he get a Navy cross? Like mm -hmm. what what happened there? Well, it wasn't he eventually received a Navy cross for for his time on Guadalcanal? But um, the reality was Nimitz showed up without enough Navy crosses for everybody, so uh, he ran out <laughs> and he he gave Mangrum a DFC. Uh, when you look at what what Richard Mangrum did on the uh, first attack on the uh, on the Japanese transport force during the Eastern Solomons. Mm -hmm. um, the mission's been mischaracterized, I think, many times over the years. They were actually launched to go after what they thought was the Kido Butai. And they had been launched earlier the night before, uh, I think on the 24th. And they, they just encountered... Uh, such heavy weather that they had to turn around. But these guys, especially the Midway veterans, realized if they were going up against the carriers, they're going to absolutely run into, you know, buzzsaw of zeros. Um, they're going to run into heavy any aircraft fire. They needed John L. to protect them. Uh, on the 25th, when they were out looking for uh, the Kido Butai again, uh, they were searching. John L.'s guys ran out of uh, fuel. Uh, endurance. They had to turn around and go home, but Mangrum decided to keep looking, and he uh, stumbled across the transport force, not the Kido Butai, and they attacked the transports um, and caught him completely by surprise. But when Mangrum dove on his target, his bomb failed to release, and he didn't know it until he pulled out and his wingman let him know, you know, you still got your bomb. Well, I, like in most normal human beings would say, okay, just jettison the bomb and keep going and get back. I mean, he, he was already around. low on fuel. He turned around, climbed back up to 12,000 feet. Or no, I, I don't think he went that high, but he still burned fuel climbing back up for an attack and dove on a target again by himself with the entire task force's anti-aircraft guns uh, wheeled, you know, directed at him. And when the guys learned in, in the squadron learned that he did this, there was astonishment. Like, uh, in fact, there was great concern that he wasn't going to come home. So everybody was waiting with, uh, you know, bated breath at Henderson for the sound of a, you know, SBD's engine in the distance. And sure enough, he did make it back. Um, and that was eventually recognized. I think that's one of the reasons he received his Navy, Navy cross. Uh, but after he passed Dennis bird and Henry highs went, um, and tried to, um, initiate a medal of honor review of that mission for him. And I, I mean, you could debate whether or not it was, uh, something that, that the medal of honor, you know, um, it's deserving of a medal of honor. I personally think it was, um, but it, it never went anywhere. Yeah. And, you know, you, you see guys like, and not that John L didn't deserve it because he did, but John L gets it. Bob Gaylor gets it. Uh, you know, Joe Foss. I mean, there, there, there's all these guys that, that do get the, the blue ribbon as we call it. And, and they get it for killing Japanese. They get it for shooting down Japanese aircraft and they deserve it. 
but exactly to your point, it's and to what we were saying just a minute ago, it's the SBDs that are doing the ship killing. It's the yeah. dauntless, don't lie, as we say, that are doing. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That, that. that are doing the ship killing, and it's the truth. Rezo Tanaka doesn't turn that that uh, uh, transport force around if Dick Mangrum is not overhead dropping bombs on his head. Yep. He, he doesn't turn that around, and and it's fortuitous that. They don't find Kido Butai for many reasons, not the least of which is they probably would have had a bad day. I'm talking about Mangrum's people. But yeah. by finding that transport group, the overall mission for the for those guys on that island, all of them, be they infantry, dive bomber, fighter pilot, whatever, it didn't matter. Their overall mission is to hold that island. And the only way that they can hold that island is by keeping Japanese off of it. Yep. And by sinking or and attacking and sinking this transport convoy, that is one of the major first major reinforcements coming down, Ichiki notwithstanding, this starts that 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 very mission. You know, he turns around, yep. he forces that Tanaka to turn around and not bring those people ashore, which would have had a direct effect on Kawaguchi's assault on Hendricks on, on uh, Edson's Ridge later on in the following month. I mean, there's no question whatsoever and and it's something that people don't really put into effect because it happens so close to eastern solomons everybody looks at that carrier battle which is also one of the least understood carrier battles of the entire war and this gets shuffled off to the side but it's huge i would argue that it's one of the major turning points of the entire campaign that is the turning point of the war is that first repulsion of that japanese troop convoy the first of many but it's that first one this is the first time. Oh, absolutely. And when you look at what happened after that one, and they run the the um, Tokyo Express down on the 28th, and Mangrum's attack on that convoy, or on, on that Tokyo Express run, was absolutely brilliant. I mean, it was carried out at sunset in, in difficult conditions. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a masterful uh, dive bombing attack. And when you look at how difficult it is, to hit a destroyer yeah. and like a fast moving destroyer. Look at what happened was June 5th yes. at Midway yeah. yep. where, where 59 Dauntlesses dive on a single Japanese destroyer and, and nobody and can't it. hit it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the Marines do. And, and so to, so flight 300 from the enterprise basically becomes um, uh, part of Mangrum's force because they arrive uh, during Eastern Solomons and they're there all the way until the uh, latter half of September flying with uh, 232 on every mission. And they're sharing the responsibility of the searches and, you know, their, their strikes were interleaved between 232 guys and flight 300 guys. So, uh, you know, I don't want to take away from guys like Ensign Fink, who's, who was a dead eye with, uh, you know, the number of bomb hits that one pilot scored is amazing. But um, when you look at what happened on the 25th and the destruction uh, that they achieved on Tanaka's group, uh, that was heading down, it definitely uh, reshaped the landscape strategically in the eyes and minds of the Japanese leadership. And in part, like Larry Baldinus uh, was the one who dove on the Jinstu, which was uh, Tanaka's flagship. Mm -hmm. And he put the bomb, uh, he put his thousand pounder right forward of the bridge and killed every killed and wounded a bunch of people around Tanaka knocked him off his feet I think he was knocked unconscious I mean it was it was a devastating hit and between that and the fact that the 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 uh, Tokyo Express on the 28th was hit and the skipper uh, in charge of that task force turned the fleet around it created contention and friction within the Japanese naval yep. officer ranks that um, ends up playing a major role in the uh, um, ensuing next few months, for sure. I mean, Tanaka even loses his job at one point for a while. I mean, it, it's just a, um, amazing the effect that those small number of Marine dive bomber pilots and crews uh, had on the, on the Imperial Navy at this point. So John, go ahead, Bill. I'm sorry, I recently did an episode on PTSD focused on Captain McVeigh of USS Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. um, oh. 
that was an issue with some of these guys too, wasn't it? Very much so. Yeah, uh, very much so. It was extremely um, misunderstood. Uh, there was an attempt to just kind of brush it all under the rug. Although, you know, it was discussed in the movie, um, the best years of our lives, you see Dana Andrews yes. characters suffering from PTSD. So they, there was a cultural understanding that the guys who were coming home, um, were struggling with things that they had seen, but they didn't really understand, um, how to treat it and what to do for sure. And I think that, um, that cost us dearly as a nation. That, that's personified in John L. Smith because you, 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 you mentioned earlier he was an emotional guy and he saw with his own two eyes a lot of his pilots not only be hit, but a lot of them be killed. As a matter of fact, on one, I forget the date, but when he gets shot down, when John L. gets shot down on his trek back to Henderson Field, he walks past the body or the airplane with the body of one of his pilots still in it. And that stuff really, really, really starts to affect John L. Smith in a very, very negative way, as it, one would imagine that it obviously would. He uh, he carries these things with him for the rest of his life. And in a matter of fact, I got it right here in front of me. In a letter to his wife, mm -hmm. Louise, he writes, Louise, darling. This is John L. Smith, by the way. I haven't the least idea of what's going to happen to me and this squadron. Have lost the best I started out with. Lost one the same day I was shot down. I would have rather had it been me instead of him. Hope I can see his family when I get back and tell them what a swell Marine he was. I know they will be proud of him. He just re received the Distinguished Flying Cross. Really no justice in war, or he certainly would have gotten through. I have gotten 18 of them so far, and I'm getting sick of seeing them burn and blow up in my face. Several times I've had to duck to get out of the debris. An admiral pinned the Navy cross on me the other morning. I'm proud to get it. Expect that they think it's good payment for seeing young pilots who are sharing my tent go down in flames day after day. I don't mind saying that I am sick of the whole mess. It, that is an incredible letter. Isn't it? yeah, it's heartbreaking. It just chokes me up. Yeah, the pilot it's, it's that he's heartbreak. talking about is Red Kendrick, by the way, the Stanford prodigy. Mm -hmm. That's the pilot he talks about. Yeah, Harvard um, Law grad. Yeah, he he wasn't able to graduate from Harvard Law. He he started and then joined the Corps. But yeah, um, so John L. Early on has an experience uh, that most fighter pilots don't have, uh, and that is. You know, when you talk to a fighter pilot, they talk about shooting the aircraft, not the people inside. Sure. And the, the killing is, is remote. Um, for some of them, when they were involved in strafing attacks, they saw firsthand, you know, but from a distance, what a 50 caliber round will do to a human body. Uh, and it was, it was shocking to them. Uh, but, but with John L., there was a mission where he came across a uh, Japanese bomber that was crippled and the, the gunners were all either dead or incapacitated. The plane was smoking and it was in a gentle dive towards the sea. And he went to finish it off and realized he ran out of ammunition. So um, he pulled up alongside and studied it and was looking at it when the tail gunner uh, began uh, like the flames got back to the tail tail gun compartment and uh, something happened either he he fell out of the 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 tail gun position or a chunk of the fuselage with the greenhouse um tore off uh, either way that gunner in front of John L and he was only a few meters away when it happened ends up falling out of the aircraft and plunging to his death as the flames start licking through the, uh, that section of the fuselage. And that stuck with him. It stuck with him seeing the, the dorsal turret just covered in blood. Um, you know, the bullets, uh, bullet riddled canopy clearly showed the crew, had, the, the pilots had been killed or wounded, uh, beyond their capacity to, to pilot the airplane. Um, and he came back and he talked to a couple of guys from uh, VMF 212 about that. And 
he mentioned it a couple of times during the hero tour it like stuck with him and then uh later on in his life he mentioned it again um so those were the sorts of memories that he carried away from from guadalcanal of his own experience in combat and then what really got him and what i think um cast the longest shadow over his life was the loss of these so many of these second lieutenants that he, oh, yeah. he loved he came to love mm-hmm. and and that's where his leadership style really was the double-edged sword there's a reason why leadership is supposed to have a buffer between uh, you know the ranks uh, because you do have to order these men to do things that could potentially get them killed and john l became their buddies he was not just their skipper he was their friend and he uh, like he lived with them in the same tents i mean he mentions that in the letter uh he's not by himself in a command tent with you know the squadron flight surgeon or somebody else he's with his guys and when they start dying especially in september um the two two michigan kids uh bailey was one of the first to die Zen Pond, his best friend, goes down um, a few weeks later, uh, one after another after another. They lose, um, you know, an extraordinary percentage of the squadron. And that is what um, lingers with John L. for the rest of his life. And it, it shapes everything. He had, he, it, it does. And he he's one of these tragic figures in American history who is a hero one minute, you know, and by one minute, I'm talking about during the war. And then unfortunately he's cast aside and he's cast aside by the service that he loved so much, which was the United States Marine Corps. And it deeply affects him that too. Not only does his, do his war memories affect him greatly, but so does his post-war activities too. Uh, he, he, you know, he suffers a really bad life after the war you know and the war obviously haunts him for the rest of his life and you know he goes through a series of jobs and and some of them are good and some of them are not good and then he also gets cast out of those two or cast away from those as well and he meets a very very sad ending john let's let's discuss this john l smith is is he he winds up taking his own life but let, let's talk about that so john l uh, i think part of part of the thing that magnified John L's struggles was when, when you look at Mary and Carl and, and the kind of relationship he had with Edna, his wife, uh, which forms their meeting is kind of the, the peak of part one of, uh, of starvation Island. Uh, Edna was not just the perfect Marine Corps wife, but the perfect wife. I mean, I'm not going to say their marriage was perfect. It wasn't, Um, They had their struggles, they had their challenges like any other married couple, but they were absolutely loyal to each other. And Marion used to say, um, the first star was Edna's, the second star was mine. You know, anybody can make Colonel, but it takes a great wife to make General. And uh, that that's actually, Marion said that to me, the first time I ever heard that saying was during that first interview. John L. did not have that with Louise. And in fact, um, for whatever reason, Louise became a, a very embittered. Uh, I know there was infidelity there, but um, uh, you know, the family, when I talked to the family, talked about how vicious she would go after John L. So there wasn't the support. There wasn't the sort of... Um, uh, wife who would understand and and help you know try to see what her husband went through through his eyes that just that just didn't exist and ultimately it it, you know the marriage failed uh and he remarried in the early 60s to another person named louise incidentally which was kind of confusing at first when i started the whole (laughs) process um but John L. had a knack for speaking the blunt truth and speaking his opinion without regard to what it would do to his career. And ultimately that caught up with him because um, he was passed over for a star. And 
this was this was a, a an enormous blow to him because more than anything, that's what he wanted. He wanted to become a general, a Marine general. And Richard Mangrum had become one. Bob Gaylor had become one. Fike had become one. Marion Carl had become one. And now he, among the leaders at, at Guadalcanal, has been passed over. And I tried to kind of sift through you know, why he was passed over and what happened. And I, I tell you, I had um, a research partner on this book, um, Larry Lassis, mm. In oh, Larry. incredible, incredible mm. guy. Uh, Larry was instrumental in, in uh, helping me with this book. And he looked into this, um, couldn't, we, we couldn't pin it down exactly what happened, but, the suspicion that we both had was that there was somebody from the Guadalcanal days who was so embittered and angry with John L that when they had an opportunity to stick a knife in his back, they did it mm -hmm. and it cost him his star. And when that happened, um, he went into a depression, he spiraled, he'd already been struggling with alcohol. Like at worse, uh, he ended up in a psychiatric ward, uh, over uh, Christmas and New Year's holiday, and and actually Mary and Carl went and visited him there. Um, nobody else did, but but Marion did. Um, the Navy mishandled his case completely and just let him released him without really treating him or doing anything. Uh, I don't think he even saw a psychiatrist or a mental health specialist. He just saw a flight surgeon while he was there, or just a regular doctor. Uh, it was a, it was a very tragic situation, uh, and and through the sixties when he left the Corps and became uh, went into the defense industry, um, very quickly you realized that the reason why he was on these you know, getting these jobs was because these defense contractors wanted a Medal of Honor yep. recipient to be the schmoozer, the one who kind of closes the deals. And basically be their captive hero. And he hated that role and he hated himself for it. And he drank heavier and heavier and tried uh, to take his own life in France at one point uh, by crashing his car into a brick wall. There was another incident with, um, with a shotgun. So prior to him actually taking his own life um, in the early 70s, the, he had had a couple of prior attempts. And then when he actually did take his life, it was almost like, you know, I don't know if, if you guys um, are religious, um, whether this is karma, the universe or God, you know, trying to send John L a message. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. But he had to really go to extraordinary lengths to finally take his own life. And, you know, the universe gave him chance after chance. And he just, he didn't, didn't want to, he wanted, he wanted to end the misery. And that is like, I've lost, I've lost a lot of veteran friends to suicide. I get the, uh, I get the disconnect when you come home from combat and, you know, you have this, you know, peaceful nation where just about everybody around you has no clue what you've just experienced. I mean, it's the reason why I started the book with the guys home experiencing that disconnect in a, you know, elite restaurant in, in Washington, DC. I really wanted to highlight how big of a gap there is between our warrior class and our people here at home, home who are protected by them. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, for, for John L, you know, this, uh, he was one of the greatest Marine Corps leaders, not just aviation leaders but one of the greatest marine corps leaders uh of the 20th century um and yet this is this is his fate and it wasn't unique because you look at what happened to red mike edson yep. edson and his raiders saved the perimeter during the two-day battle of bloody ridge two-night yep. battle and he takes his own life in the 50s so there was a sense, I think, among these men that they'd just been cast off. And I know from the, the men that, that I have seen and I have been friends with uh, through the war on terror, 
Um, when they came back, they were never able to get traction and get footing in civilian life because of everything that they'd experienced and seen and the lack of understanding or willingness to understand what they went through um, in their own personal lives with the people around them. And time after time, I see, um, like I wrote a book called The Devil's Sandbox, which was about an Oregon National mm -hmm. Guard unit uh, that had been in Iraq. Uh, one of my closest friends from that project is uh, Sergeant Major Vince Jocks. Uh, one day, Vince was at a coffee shop and just some random, rando Oregonian turns around and starts calling him a baby killer because he was in uniform. I mean, like coming home to stuff like that, like the, the World mm -hmm. War II set didn't really experience that too much, mm -hmm. although they did put something like that in there in um, best years of our lives with the, mm -hmm. you know, the scene in the, uh, uh, in the soda shop. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what I marveled at uh, with Vince when, when, he, you know, this guy did that to him, had that been me, after I came back from Afghanistan, I would have lost it. I would have probably ended up in jail because I would have been throwing punches right away. Uh, Vince just was like, okay, that's your opinion. And I'm, you know, part of the reason why you can have that opinion. Exactly. I mean, that's a level of discipline and, and self-possession that I lack. So um, it's a very real real um issue even today and it became it accelerated after our withdrawal from afghanistan for sure so john l you're, you're, oh go, go ahead Bill. i'm sorry i, I was, was just gonna, gonna say, say your point about the di dichotomy the the, the, the kafka-esque nature of coming back from combat um is exactly right so you know I remember, you know, the 9-11, the obviously I was in the Pentagon. And um, for a while, and when I say a while, I'm thinking maybe a month, um, the, the nation was properly focused on the issues of importance of the day. <clears throat> but that evaporated, you know, within a month. And, you know, I was still on active duty for another five years, I remember I was aware of when Operation Red Wings occurred. That's the event that's depicted in the movie Lone Survivor. And I was aware of that real time. And when it was finally disclosed what happened, um, I was watching the news trying to see how it was going to be covered. This is 2006, 2005, 2006. Can't, well, I, sh I should know that. And on the news that night, they briefly mentioned it. And... Then there was a story on Britney Spears that lasted way longer than the story um, of importance of, of that night, right? And and that's always stuck with me. And you know, I was you know, I was in Afghanistan, Iraq. I didn't do combat tours, but, but I visited, was there, and even coming back from the short time I was there, and seeing how disconnected the country was and of course these guys you know in the 50s red mike you know the vietnam thing hadn't happened yet uh, but there were some high profile suicides in those days that made national news and it's and of course what was happening in america in the 60s with the protests and that's when the baby killer thing really happened i joined the navy in 1974 john they were still spitting on you if you walk through Chicago O'Hare uniform, O'Hare in uniform. And I was 17. I looked like I was 14. And you were still getting spit on as an out. Unbelievable. Thing, right? It that was unbelievable. And so these guys that were real heroes, seeing what the country has become. And yeah, I agree. I agree. There's probably some marital issues there as well. Um, it's horrible, and it's horrible that we haven't learned uh, anything, it seems to me, from all of that, because the suicide rate is as high or higher than it was for those guys. 
Uh, for sure. For sure. And, and honestly, Bill, one of the reasons why I started the book with the Heroes Tour and the guy's back. So I wanted to show that in 1942, uh, it, it was a lot like how America was in the war on terror, really. I mean, when Pearl Harbor had happened, there was that initial shock. And then, you know, the football games continued. The nights out on the town continued. Yeah. There, there, you know, the, um, the number of, of telegrams that had gone to families telling them that their person overseas in uniform was, was dead was only 19,000. I like to say only 19,000. I mean, like today that, sure. that would just be a massive catastrophe, but I mean, this is a country that had, uh, still had the you know living memory of the civil war where 600,000 plus were killed and you know what 150,000 in, in just a matter of months in 1918 uh, during world war one so mm -hmm. uh, while the numbers were large you know 19,000 is a lot of lives that was diffused within all the communities of 150 million you know plus nation and it wasn't until 1943 that every neighborhood had a gold star family because now we're you know in yeah, full in contact <clears throat> everywhere mm -hmm. pacific north africa mediterranean and then 1944 i mean it's just a steady stream and yep. and that's when i think the u.s population really starts to understand the magnitude of what we were in uh, we were we were in this neverland in 1942 playing at war and the reporters certainly didn't understand it. That's why I included the the whole um, press core briefing, the first one that the guys went through. Uh, the the press was was asking them questions about like, how come you're not tan? You were you were out in the Pacific. Why aren't you tan? What kind of a question is that to ask somebody who's just come through 53 days on Guadalcanal? <laughs> it's just nuts. It's nuts. And somebody asked him about the nightlife. What was the nightlife like on Guadalcanal? I mean, it sucked. I, I, yeah, it's like, well, you know, if the Japanese don't attack, you can get some sleep as I think what the, one of them answered. I think John L quipped that, but I, I mean, the disconnect was there in 42, like it is, you mm -hmm. know, now I think the difference is um, the guys understood the importance, men and women in uniform understood the importance back then. And the country at large did as well. But by 2012, 2013, uh, culturally and, and socially, I think America moved on from the war on terror and, and just kind of put it in the attic. It was still going on and we just weren't paying attention. And by you know, 2004, John, in my view, not 2012, uh, okay. 2015, right? I, and we yeah. have very short attention spans. I, I would yeah. argue that in, that in nineteen forty. To, through through the end of the war. I mean, obviously, if you've got someone overseas, your son or your brother or father or whatever, you're going to be paying a little, little close, you won't hope, a little closer attention to the situation as it's going on. But, you know, there's this mythology, and, and we're going to do an episode on the home front as it relates to Japan and the United States at some point here in the future. But there's this mythology that the place I used to work for perpetuates is that we're all in it together. That is the biggest bunch of I've ever heard in my life, because if you actually know anything at all about the world war II American home front, you know, damn well that we most certainly were not all in it together. That, as you said, that initial fervor after Pearl Harbor was very real. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt, very real, but it, Faded away <laughs> by about, you know, August, September, 1942, when this campaign that we just talked about for the last couple of hours is, was going down and it didn't really pick up every now and then there was a spike, you know, D days of spike, obviously, um, you know, some of the eighth air force raids over Europe, Europe always takes precedence over the Pacific in the headlines always has always will for, for whatever reason, you know, yeah. There are spikes in American awareness of the war. But by and large, the only thing that people in the United States, Continental 48, were concerned about was if they could get enough hamburger the next night to have a meal. That's the only thing they care about. Or if they had enough gas, about not having enough gas to go to the movie on Saturday night with their girl or whoever. And, 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 and sacrifice. 
Yeah, yeah. The, so there, that that whole mythology of you know American home front sacrifices is, is just that it's a myth, mm -hmm. and the disconnect between the American populace then and now and the actual war fighters, the warriors, was so great that it's it's you can't you can't bridge that you can't you couldn't then you can't now and uh it's it's a travesty it truly is and and it's it it is but seth you're 100 percent again like man i love talking to you guys <laughs> we're just so co-aligned um one of the reasons why i included the brewster chapters mm -hmm. uh in 53 days yep. was to show the dark side of uh, the defense defense industry in in World War II because you never really hear about that. You hear about you know the Grummans and the Boeings and yeah. the Douglases. You don't and hear the about Americans. the failures. <laughs> but my gosh, here's here's a company whose CEO is in prison, getting massive royalties for illegal arms sales that he was you know thrown in prison for, and then as soon as he gets out, he takes over the company and they're just fleecing the Navy fleecing the navy and and at the same time management is fleecing fleecing the u.s government they're supposed to be producing what was to be the replacement of the sbd the sb2a buccaneer and the the employees at the the buccaneer factory in hatboro pennsylvania they are working in a state-of-the-art facility that the navy had built purpose built so that they could have a you know a better aircraft than the dauntless uh, for for the years ahead, and you know they, they're spending tens of millions of dollars, and nothing's coming out of the factory, and the uh, the labor relations. When you look at what was going on between labor and management, I mean, they would do work slowdowns just because an employee got chewed out by a security guard for driving down the wrong road um, uh, instead of going to the parking lot that they were supposed to, you know, there was cases when you look at the, uh, congressional inquiry, they were running prostitution rings on the floor of the factory, having sex inside the, uh, uh, the fuselage, uh, assemblies of these half built buccaneers, which were dogs of an aircraft anyway, and ultimately couldn't be used. I mean, the vast majority of them went straight from, uh, hat bro to the uh to the scrap yard um so uh, there were a lot of problems for sure but then at the mm -hmm. flip side you know the, the grumman plant was uh, the grumman company was run with a with a real esprit de corps and they end up creating the weapons that helped win the war yeah. so grumman iron i works. guess i guess the lesson is you're always going to have the people who are in their own bubble you're always going to have the people who are selfish and unaware. Um, you're always going to have the the people who try to profit from the catastrophe. I mean, I saw that firsthand with the Afghan evacuation. Um, but the great strength of America is that in every crisis and in even every dark hour that we have ever had, enough good men and women come forward to carry the day and 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 see us through to preserve the republic and and keep us uh keep us functional and yeah. that's an amazing thing because I, you can't say that with every nation no you can't and it, it this book right here and your previous one which is back there are prime <laughs> examples of several of those americans who have done that very th or those very things that you just mentioned um I do think as much as I would love to continue this conversation, we're going to have to, we're going to have to wrap it up here, but I, I urge everyone to, if, first of all, number one, if you haven't read the book, that's over your right shoulder, there, race of aces, I can see it through your uh, bookcase there, pick it up, read it. It's outstanding. Starvation on 53 days on starvation Island came out. What John, like two weeks ago, three weeks yeah. ago, something like that. Yeah. I got my copy from your publicist about, a month and a half ago so I, I had time to i had time to get through it it's outstanding it is a fantastic read it's very important it's and it covers like, you know, like the guys that we talked about and many more too many guys that, that are also in there that we haven't talked about it's a fantastic read pick it up and john i just got to say it's always a pleasure we have not done this often enough 
<laughs> Thank you, you so much. We need you to come back on. We still we're in we're in 1945 right now in the show, and no, for everybody's listening, no, the show is not going to die after September 1st, 1945. We got a lot of stuff we want to talk about, but regardless of this, we do need to wrap up the ace race with Bong and McGuire with you. So we need you to come back on with us. We want to we want to dish we, we want you to dish on Tommy McGuire especially because he <laughs> was just freaking cool. Yeah, just a cool dude, man. He really is. He really is. Well, I I appreciate the the uh, invite, and I would love to. I I've actually created a little studio here in my uh, I see that in my Cold War base. Um, I'm in what was codenamed Ring Dove during the Cold War. It's uh, uh, the Adair Air Force Station's uh, Air Defense Command Center, and uh, and that is cool. <laughs> yeah, it's um, complete with cats. <laughs> complete with cats and air force soundproofing from the 1960s so i have to hand it to the air force they made this very quiet <laughs> that is awesome that was awesome. well I, I got it my office is okay but it's not a cold where you know remnant <laughs> <laughs> it's probably much warmer <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i don't know well is there right, anything guys, else you guys want to some read behind me does that count that counts. <laughs> right that on. counts. Yeah. That counts. Is there anything else you guys want to throw in before we conclude this? I, what I thought was absolutely fascinating discussion on several of these pivotal individuals in the Guadalcanal campaign. Well, just want to say thanks for the opportunity to talk about them, guys. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. And we're glad you were able to do it. And we're looking forward to having you on again. So uh, we need to yes. do this more often more often well with that we want to thank you very much for listening and or watching to the unauthorized history of the pacific war podcast please give us a rating and review if you have the opportunity we'd appreciate it uh, if you want to watch a video of this if you're not already doing it look at our youtube channel called the unauthorized history of the pacific war podcast once again by john's book 53 days on starvation island i'm sure you could probably get it at your local barnes and noble or amazon i know it's on there i've seen it on there multiple times Pick it up. It's definitely worth your time. It's a very good read. Once again, my name is Seth Parrott, and I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching. John, thank you very much for sitting with us and talking about this fascinating and very, very important topic. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Bill, bring us home. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs>